The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Yes, it's a best of three series, but history is not on the side of the Baltimore Orioles after losing game one of this wild card series. They will try to stay alive today, a little bit later today than yesterday, 4.30 start. But it's win or go home. Of course, they're already home. They're in Baltimore. And if it goes to game three tomorrow, they stay in Baltimore. But uh, they are in a bad position right now. And I'll explain more on that in just a moment. We'll do some more uh, flower throwing at uh, Jaden Daniels, who has set the NFL on its ear. Top 10 in the power rankings for just about everybody. Stephen A. Smith going overboard, putting them at five. I mean, it's it's insanity right now and uh, it's fun it's uh it's a whole lot of fun and it's refreshing for an organization that's been an absolute disaster for uh almost 30 years and and not all of it dan snyder you, you know yes uh he deserves the bulk of the blame for how bad things were for the last 20 years or so but uh, it really started after joe gibbs left the first time and uh and in north turner was you know really no bargain as a head coach. But, you know, that's history. And uh, right now we're looking forward. Like uh, like J.D. Vance tried to say last night, <laughs> they're looking ahead. They're not looking at the past. Um, I want to play something. I don't usually play something this long, but uh, I'll get to this in about 20 minutes. Johnny Bench was on the Dan Patrick Show yesterday. And uh, you have probably read or watched a lot of tributes to Pete Rose. But when you think of the big red machine, you think of primarily three players, two in the Hall of Fame and one who had the numbers to be there, which, of course, is Pete. Uh, one of them, Joe Morgan, who passed away several years ago, uh, went on to a great broadcasting career after Hall of Fame playing career. And the other is Johnny Bench, who is, I don't think without question, uh, the best catcher in the history of baseball. Yogi Berra won more championships, and uh, Pudge Fisk was great. But uh, I I don't think if you talk to baseball people that uh, there would be much debate that Johnny Bench is the best of all time. And that trio was the backbone of the Big Red Machine, which won back-to-back World Series in 1975 and 1976. And uh, Bench was just so good yesterday on the Dan Patrick Show that I'm going to play 15 minutes of that interview. I don't usually play something that long, but we're going to get to that uh, shortly. As for Jaden Daniels, I mean, (laughs) what else do you say about a guy who has uh, completed 82% of his passes, has thrown only one interception uh, in week one? Yeah, you saw some growing pains, but he's growing up really fast. And right now, he's not only in the discussion for Rookie of the Year, He's in the discussion for MVP. Can this keep up for another 13 games? Eh, probably not. Uh, will he get this team to the Super Bowl? No. Uh, only uh, there's, I think there's only five rookie quarterbacks who have ever made it to the league championship game, and all of them played with great defenses, like you know Brock Purdy, um, like. Um, like what we had with uh, Ben Roethlisberger years ago with the Steelers. Uh, it, it would be really something if this team just, first of all, makes the playoffs. If it somehow wins a playoff game, that's a great season. But to really dream beyond that with this defense, unless it improves incredibly over the next you know month, month and a half, you know, you're looking at a team which is exciting to watch and, uh, and has, has caught the attention of certainly of NBC. There was a report yesterday – that NBC wanted to flex the game with Baltimore, which is a week from Sunday uh, at M&T Bank Stadium, to Sunday night to their 8.30 window. And CBS, which has the right to do this, I I don't know how this works with how many you can block and how many you can claim, but there's different windows for when the networks can do this. So while NBC tried to grab it and put it on Sunday night, uh, CBS said, no, 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 that's the game we want. And that's probably going to be the game with Nance and Romo. And there's all kinds of, uh, interest in that, especially if, if, if the commanders win again. Um, and Adam Schefter said this yesterday that he's been hearing from people throughout the league that Jaden Daniels is Lamar Jackson 2.0. 
So who wouldn't want that buildup there? I mean, we're already going to have that later this month when uh, Caleb Williams comes to town with the Bears. I'm going to go to that game. Looking forward to that. But uh, no, this would be this would be really big for NBC and CBS. Said nope. Nope, where we want it for ourselves. I, I don't think they're going to flex it until four o'clock. I, I don't. I don't even know if you can do that at this point. But right now, it's a it's a one o'clock game uh, in Baltimore. As for what uh, the NBC analyst is saying, Chris Collinsworth. Now, right now, the Commanders are not scheduled to be on Sunday night. But if this keeps up, obviously they're going to be flexed into it. If if not. You know, the Baltimore game, it's going to happen somewhere down the road this season. And uh, Collinsworth was on yesterday on the Rich Eisen show, and uh, this is his take on what he's seen from Daniel so far, uh, having done a a preseason game and uh, watched him play in that Monday night game in Cincinnati where he lives. We did have him in a preseason game, so I got a chance to meet him. I I loved him when he was playing at LSU. As a matter of fact, I had him down as my top quarterback. I, I thought it was very close. Um, but if I had to take one, I, I said I would have taken Jaden. Um, and the reason for that was that I kept seeing Lamar. And, uh, you know, the more that the, the thing that I loved about or love about both of those quarterbacks is that in their heart, they're, they're a drop back passer. They, they both want to win from the pocket. They want to make their plays from the pocket. And so everything else is an add on on top of that. So now you've got the read option, you've got the reverse, you've got different things that come out of it. Uh, The ability to, you know, put great pressure on and strain on pass rushers because they've got to check whether or not Jaden Daniels is going to run the football first or not. Now, you know, they they don't have a Derrick Henry on that team and nobody else does either. But I, I thought all along, and then he, you know, first week it looked, eh, it was okay. Um, but uh, but you're starting to see emerge what I saw in college, which is that same sort of look. I mean, the Bengals, you know, say whatever you want, they went up and down the field on that Monday night game, and they could not keep pace hmm. with Jay Daniels. So. I think Dan Quinn's excited. I think the people in that building are extremely excited. There was never a doubt once practice started um, who the quarterback there was going to be. He was a natural leader. People gravitated to him. Uh, He has no fear of leading amongst older guys. And when you talk to him, he's just a really sharp guy. He knows what he's doing already. He understands offensive football and what that's going to be so i think his future is very 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 bright i think that would be an understatement that his future is bright at least the immediate future and uh knock for micah here in the studio he doesn't get hurt but uh right now uh things are going swimmingly uh for him um the the one point that uh, collinsworth made there about uh that the bengals couldn't keep up that they were going up and down the field that that's a double edged sword there because the fact that the Bengals were able to stay in a game where Daniels was damn near perfect, where he didn't throw an interception and had only two incomplete passes um, tells you where this defense is right now. So that's, that's the weak spot. And uh, I, the offense right now is overcoming that in the last three games, but I don't think they're going to be able to keep that up long term. The defense has to play like they did in the late stages of the Arizona game. I think it was more uh, mistakes on the Cardinals and the and the way that they were running their offense more than anything else. But uh, at least at least they're scoring enough points to keep it interesting. And uh, so far win their last three games. Uh, Herm Edwards also making the rounds yesterday showed up on the Dan Patrick show. You know that Herm coached him when he was a freshman at ASU and uh, has stayed in touch with him and um the comparison that he makes and and he'll probably explain this here was uh and he played i think he played briefly with him if not um he was a member of the eagles organization and, and familiar with randall cunningham and and that's the comparison that he keeps making now cunningham what you may have seen when he was with the cowboys and the vikings at the end of his career was a lot different than the way he was when he came up with the eagles in the mid 80s but that that has been herm's comparison ever since the season started and he know who would know Jaden daniels as well as herm he brought him to arizona state coached him for a year and as he says here uh has stayed in contact with him uh, you know i talk to him every week e- even now 
uh, when he when he when he left, and obviously, you know, through the NLI and all that stuff with the LSU, I would talk to him every week and still do. Um, not surprising at all. Uh, the game is never too big for him. And then, you know, and, and I told you this before. He reminds me a lot of Randall Cunningham, and I told him that when he's playing for me. He's about the same height, uh, same size. Uh, can throw the long ball very well, uh, and uh, now you know, the more he plays, uh, obviously the speed of the game is you know, is all of a sudden slowing down for him some. But um, he's got this team with, you know, he's giving them hope all of a sudden. Washington, if you'd have told me at the end of four weeks that the Washington Commanders are in first place in the in the NFC, in the NFC East, I would go, no, really, with a rookie quarterback. Does it concern you, or how much does the running with Jaden concern you? Well, it, you know, and, and that, that's always been a concern because um, he's not the biggest guy, but he's become a smarter runner. And, and that was kind of the conversation I would have with him all the time. And I said, look, you got to know when the journey's over. And I said, you got to learn how to slide because he hated slides. He didn't want to <laughs> slide. You know? he just, and I told him that for the last week, the, the week before, he didn't slide. And so I, I get on him, I said, man, Start sliding. I said, the NFL, man, they're going to hit you. I said, you got to be available every play. Yeah, I, I, I see RG3 situation here where you have that mm. speed. And RG3 didn't slide. He was taking on defenders. And, yeah. you know, I, I just – I always say, uh, uh, you know, on the show, live to see another play. You don't have to be Correct. a hero at that position. It's like Tua got injured – he didn't need to be in that situation. No, no, no. That was just silly. It was almost, it was almost his injury was one of those. He was trying to be tough. You don't have to be tough. Just finish the game. Yeah. That's your job. Quarterback, you start the game, finish the game. I respect tough, but I, I don't want my quarterback to have to prove he's tough. I need smart. There's nothing wrong with sliding, fetal position, all of those. Peyton Manning. You want to follow Peyton's script? Just fall in a fetal yeah. position. You don't have to go after the guy who picks you off. No, no. And, and, and you know, and, and that's what they pay you for. They, they pay you to start the game and finish the game. And <laughs> when, when, when you don't finish games, uh, that, that, that's a bad omen for your football team. That's Herm Edwards yesterday with Dan Patrick on the RG3 comparison. And, and it's easy to do that because he was a, a world-class runner when he was – here the the big difference that I see is that Daniels again knows how to slide. He, he's come a ways on that. He's sliding head first in the first game. Now he's sliding like like a baseball player. The other thing he's got some wiggle to his run. RG three probably should have stayed with what he had initial success with at Baylor. He had he'd gone to Baylor, given up his uh, last semester of high school like a lot of uh, football players do, and he he ran track and he had. He had Olympic possibilities as a hurdler. He was that good. And, you know, I always felt that he didn't play well with others and, and probably should have taken up something individual like that. Probably should. But he was a straight-ahead guy. He didn't wiggle. He didn't have the moves that Jaden Daniels has. And uh, so I think that's that's a big difference there. And he didn't slide. And he had this idea that he was going to take on tacklers and he would do something really stupid. He would stand on the sidelines after a run trying to get a late hit and a flag. <clears throat> the 15 yards that you get there is uh, is not that great in comparison to protecting yourself, which uh, he didn't do a very good job of, but, uh, but he did have that spectacular uh, rookie year. As for the uh, Randall Cunningham comparisons, uh, I just go back to uh, what Sonny Jurgensen said. Um, he told me once, and uh, he said, if Randall Cunningham would have been properly coached he could have become one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. And he said one of the problems was he came to the Eagles as a rookie in 1986 when Buddy Ryan was the coach. And Buddy Ryan was a defensive guy. I mean, that's where he made his bones. The, the architect of the 85 Bears, and he'd even been with the Jets when they won the championship with Namath with a great defense there. He was a great defensive coordinator, not a good head coach. And he didn't really know what to do with offense. And they had this, you may remember this, that that, that rookie year – they had Ron Jaworski still on the team. And Buddy had this idea that Jaworski would be the quarterback on first and second down and Randall Cunningham would come in on third down. That does not work. That does not work. And Randall Cunningham 
may have had a great career if he would have had, you know, somebody like a Cliff Kingsbury or the equivalent back in the 80s. And, you know, those are, again, the what if things that you always do in sports. But he had that kind of talent. I mean, he was he was incredible. He could run. Uh, They even had him because he was a punter in college as well. A couple of times they had him quick kick on third downs and he was great at that. I mean, he's just unbelievable athlete with an unbelievable arm, the ability to run, but not properly coached, especially in his early going with the Eagles. And, you know, when he went to uh, went to Minnesota, he had some really good success there with uh, Brian Billick as the offensive coordinator. That was that was really helpful to him. And that team should have gone to the Super Bowl that year. Morton Anderson or is Gary might have been Gary, no, it was Morton or Gary. I think it was Gary Anderson uh, missed missed a field goal and he had missed one all year. Went to overtime. The Dirty Bird Falcons made it and uh, got blown out by John Elway and the Broncos in the Super Bowl. So uh, I, I'm interested in that comparison, and uh, and and Herm uh, pushes that. I uh, just wanted to, to mention real quick, uh, and I'll get more into this. We do Orioles preview at 1030. We're going to have Ben McDonald on. Uh, Chelsea Janes wrote this in the Post today uh, about this format that they went to in 2022 where it's best of three and it's at home in the wild card. Remember when the Nats won the World Series in 2019, the wild card was only one game. They came from behind to beat the Brewers. But since they have gone to this format, um, all eight teams that won game one advanced and only once did a series reach three games. So the odds are not in the Orioles' favor today as they try and stay alive against uh, against Kansas City. And we'll have that game for you here coming up at uh, 4.30, 4 o'clock pregame. Coming up, a very lengthy interview with Johnny Bench, who I thought was excellent yesterday on the Dan Patrick Show. And we will play that as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Orioles preview 1030. We'll talk to Ben McDonald. And I got to ask him this. Uh, excuse my ignorance on this, but uh, I know he's been doing massing games for years. He was on the ESPN telecast yesterday. Excellent. He was really good. And, and especially in a game like that, that was a pitcher's duel. I don't know if that was his first assignment with ESPN or not, but uh, we'll ask him that coming up at uh, at 10.30. So uh, a lot of things have been written about uh, Pete Rose. Uh, one of the best I tweeted out last night from Joe Posnanski, who did a blog on Rose and his encounters with him. It's just great, great writing. Posnanski is one of the best in the business. And uh, if you have not read that, I would urge you to do that. Um, there have been various features and interviews. Bob Costas has spoken eloquently about him. Uh, there's a very good column from Tom Boswell in the Post about him today. But uh, I really haven't heard anything uh, from teammates. Uh, and, you know, if you talk about the Big Red Machine, which has gone back now almost 50 years, they won in 75 and 76. Unfortunately, uh, quite a few members of that team are gone, including Joe Morgan, who was one of the great stars on that team. And uh, and now Pete Rose is gone. But Johnny Bench is is still very much alive. And uh, and Bench actually appears from time to time on the Dan Patrick show. But the timely appearance yesterday after the death of Rose and the things that he had to say about playing with Rose, about the uh, the efforts that he made to uh, get him to turn his life around, the efforts that he made with the commissioner to try and get something done so he could get in the Hall of Fame, all of it failed. And uh, it, it sounds like it'll never happen. But uh, this is Bench yesterday, uh, just, you know, filled with sadness, filled with regret, filled with you know, what ifs on Pete Rose. And uh, here he was talking to Dan Patrick yesterday. We were in business. We played together. His goal in life was to get 200 hits. He wanted me to hit 300. I said, you hit 300, I'll drive you on 100 times. But nobody was more driven. He was the epitome of hustle, of energy and desire. If he had three hits, he wanted to get four. If he had four, he wanted to get five. I've never seen anybody ever like that. I, and the day he got five hits off of Gaylord Perry is probably one of the greatest hitting days that I can ever remember. He was in the batting title. And he, I think it was Matty Alou. And it might have been Matlock, but it was like that. And he was he was actually asking somebody in the stands how Alou was doing, how many hits he had <laughs> as he was as he was going. And he needed one more, so he went out and got one more. <laughs> and he told me stories, but it was – we were in business together, like I said, but uh, his desire and his 
need to win, his need to succeed. I, I think it, was, it all came, became, a, became part of his life because he grew up in Western Hills in Cincinnati. He was a river rat, they called him, and barely got a chance to even play the game of baseball. It was a, a, a uncle of his that was knew a scout that got him a tryout, 145 pounds, and he was never going to make it. And he wanted to prove to everybody. He wanted to be the first hundred thousand dollar singles hitter. He wanted to drive a Cadillac. And every day it was like he wanted more. And it was just, you know, it's heartbreaking because Pete's health was uh, a part of his life. His father died of a heart attack in his early sixties, and Pete's had several procedures. But to think he reached space almost six thousand times, <laughs> six thousand times. I mean, there's nobody like it. There's nobody but it. And damn it, why? Why? You know, you, you get up and you wonder why all of this happened and why a desire and a dream and the, and, pro, and the greatest hitter in the game of baseball, how he could have possibly, you know, get into a situation. And, and this, yeah, it bothered all of us, but it, and it was our, our desire to try to help him. We did everything we could. There was more than people will ever know. Well, I know you're a big proponent and backer of Pete, uh, you know, after your playing careers. Did you know if Pete bet when he was playing? There were words. There were talk. There was friends of mine who uh, who knew FBI agents, and they actually passed along a word that just, hey, tell your friend to stay as far away from him as you can. And I thought that was kind of the – as it turned out, I wasn't sure why at the time. Did I know it? No. Did I see him ever call in a bet? No. I mean, we, the only betting I ever saw him do was at the dog track and spring training. But do you think, I mean, you talk about this competitiveness. You can't turn that off. We see athletes when they're done, they need something else. Pete needed something. You know, when he played, he could, you know, as a manager, you kind of, but he needed that juice of gambling. And then when you get busted by Major League Baseball, his competitiveness, like Lance Armstrong, it doesn't allow you to apologize. That's true. And that I mean, was the his adrenaline. own worst enemy. Yes. It's the adrenaline. And let's face it. I mean, we talk about alcoholism. I've had friends of an alcohol. I see kids on drugs all the time. They have a hard time getting off. Gambling is an addiction. Let's just face it. We know it is. And it was for him. But he needed it. He wanted it. He wanted to compete. And when he didn't win, he had to double up, you know, and it's like he had to go after something else. And then when he he loved the horses, then maybe it was based basketball. Then it was football. You know, everybody bets football. And then it, how, what do you know best? Well, let's just assume it was baseball. People say, well, he only bet on the Reds to win, he said. Well, if you don't bet on them every night, you don't, you're betting against them. I mean, it was... It, I look, I got buried in Cincinnati because I didn't support Pete. I didn't support all the things that, you know, he, oh, it's okay. And then it's still rule 21, no matter what you do. I don't care what you do. And people, whenever you go to speak, first question is, and I look at them and I say, what do you think? And they said, yes. And I said, well, do you have kids? Yes. And I said, well, go home and tell them there's no more rules. And it, it's like, whoa, well, I didn't, I said, well, I'm not, I didn't make the rule. I did. I didn't make the rule. I didn't keep Pete out of, in fact, I, I went to commissioner Seelig twice, went to him a third time. He said, no, don't bring it up again. Twice. Pete, Mark, uh, Mike Schmidt, Joe Morgan, myself, but those are the bad things. But what, the if, great what things if the are, hall of fame just says, we're going to, we want him on the ballot since, I mean, they're independent of major league baseball. Would you have a problem if Cooperstown says we're going to have him on the on the ballot? It's been their choice since '89. Yeah, they've had they've had that option. It was it wasn't Major League Baseball. It was the Hall of Fame that says here's who's on the ballot. These are the guys that have played that for ten years or the certain amount of time that makes you eligible to be voted on. And they chose not to put him on the ballot. I don't have a vote. I'm not a member. I'm no you know I'm a member of the Hall of Fame, but I don't have a vote. And it's interesting to hear so many people saying they would vote for him. So many people say they not vote for him. And there were always lines drawn. And we are a forgiving society. I mean, there's people that right now have gone out and killed people. There's people caught in drug sting. There's dealing fraud. They do everything. And, and, and yet they're now the face of sports in a lot of ways. And for Pete, 
you know, I think he had a chance. I think when Uberoff was the commissioner, he tried to get Pete to sign off on a thing. And when Pete said, no, I'll beat it, then it became, uh, I will challenge it. And it's been a losing proposition for him. I mean, in the times that I said, bud, come on, let's, let's try to get him on. Okay, let's get him on. Let's see if he'll do these things. It didn't work. It didn't take. He didn't follow the rules that they had laid down. And man, for all of us, I mean, there wasn't a one. I mean, Tony Perez, Pete, to Joe Morgan, there wasn't one of us that didn't say to Pete, come on, let's do this. And, and it's sad. It's sad we have to, he has to leave his legacy with the gambling part of it rather than a legacy with 4,200 and a jillion hits, 4,256, whatever it is, 5,000 bets, five all-star games in different positions. And the desire and to make everybody better. Everybody, everywhere he went, he made everybody better. Hey, look what happened in Philadelphia when we went over there. And Mike Schmidt and all of those guys just stepped it up a notch because their intensity level, because that's what had, Pete had more than anybody. I can't tell if you're more mad or sad. Sad. Yeah. I, I, am, I am absolutely devastated. I mean, I have cried. I've actually cried because I... I didn't want this to happen. I didn't want this to happen to Pete. I wanted I wanted to save Pete. Yeah, we had our difference. We knocked heads on some certain things and everything else. There wasn't one time that we didn't shake hands or hug whenever we saw each other. I just didn't want it hanging over. I didn't want this to be part of baseball. I didn't want it to be a black eye on baseball to begin with. But I did more importantly, Pete gave everything to all of us all of us and yet this sickness this addiction was too much for him to overcome he gave you but he he didn't give you what you ultimately wanted and that is to help pete help himself yeah we had a quite a talk out in california when i was we were at an event together and he said can i see you for a minute he came and we went into a different room and he said i apologize i apologize for everything that I did to you during your Hall of Fame year, how it affected that, how I've affected you after your career, because I know all the questions are coming about me. And it takes away from what you achieved, and it probably takes away from what I achieved. But I'm sorry. I'm a, I apologize. And I thought, now is the opportunity, Pete. Now is the opportunity to really step forward and, and say, I'm sorry. You know, fall, your, fall at your feet of everyone and say, I'm sorry. And America would forgive it. I mean, you know, somebody said, you know, he would have been, he'd have been worse off shooting, you know, better off shooting somebody, I, I think, than what, what this has caused. And we seem to make, you know, certain things out of, you know, who, who took drugs. You know, all right, let's go with Barry Bond. Let's go with Roger Clemens. Let's go with Sammy Sosa. And then we take Coy Canseco and, and McGuire. And, and yet, there's guys that probably have taken it or accused of taking it, you know, that's playing now and played forever and played in the Hall of Fame or in the Hall of Fame probably. But I wonder about this. Let's say Pete didn't manage. Let's say he was seven years after his career was over. So he goes in first ballot. He's in the Hall of Fame. He decides to manage. And then they realize that he's gambling on baseball. Would the Baseball Hall of Fame take Pete out, do you think, if he was already in for what he did as a player, but he's accused of gambling as a manager. I would hope that the club would interject. I would hope that the club would step in and say, Pete, this is a warning. Everybody knows it. I mean, we have now have all the detectives in the world in Major League Baseball. They're checking everything that you do. And if they found out or something that this was a situation, you know, these are what ifs, you know. What if he never made that first bet? What if he had won his first bet? What if he had not lost the double down? What if all of these things would have happened? You know, if you don't bet on your team every night, okay, that's betting against them. That that we know. But if if he'd have, these are all scenarios that had he done it, I'm sure that I found out about it. I was the owner. I would have come down and said, Pete, no, knock this off. Or they would have fired him on the spot because the, the integrity of baseball is still the most important thing we have. What would you say to Commissioner Manfred today? Let's say he's listening to this interview. He's made that decision. He's had, had a one-on-one -on -one with Pete. He's had a one-on-one, -on -one, hour, hour and a half. 
So no budging that that he. What did you hear from that conversation he had with Pete? Well, we know what this decision was. Nothing. No, you're not. You're not going to be on the ballot. But he can't. No. And he. No. And you know this better than anybody, Johnny. Is this commissioner can't make that decision because you're going against Bud Selig and you're going against Bart Giamatti. And I, I don't think he wants. This isn't a legacy that you want. I mean, he's this commissioner's done some good things for baseball. I just don't know. It it seems hypocritical if you put him in posthumously. Well, the thing that the thing that bothers me today is everything is gambling. You're probably being sponsored by something. Yes. I mean, we're we're now condoning it, and we're now seeing it. I'm watching the game yesterday, and I see ninety percent probability the Braves will win, ten percent on the Mets. Now they scored three runs. Now it's 60-40. I mean, now you got it on your phone where you can t- you can bet on swings, they say. You can bet on foul balls. You can bet on pitchers or strikeouts. I mean, it's become part of it. And now we see a couple of young players who now have been banned from baseball or at least suspended. I think that's that's the thing we have to have to figure out. But is, I can't. You know, no, but you could alter the game. Baseball is looking at it differently. Baseball is actually looking at this differently now. Well, they're doing this to make money off fans. You can't have the people involved in these games with the potential to alter the outcome. That's why I know they're in bed with gambling, but players can't be involved in this because they can manipulate the outcome. Fix a game. Well, so can the, so can the fans. Strangely enough, I mean, if you ever been to a golf tournament when a guy's in his back swing oh, yeah. and somebody coughs or sneezes or his phone happens to chirp or anything else because he doesn't want him to hit the ball in a fair way or he doesn't want all of these there's scenarios these are possibilities yes i understand the money's out there and that's what it's all about is having the owners and paying for the salaries that they've got out there that's that's understandable that's what we do we're all in it for the dollar at this point as they say the owners would say and that's what we're going to have to do if we're going to give a 700 million dollar contract somehow <laughs> we've got to pay for it yeah. i mean you know i mean i'm sure that you know even in the Wow, seven hundred million, two million, fifty million—that's a lot. But it's it. I think baseball is starting to take a different look at it now. Okay, we're condoning betting, and should we take another look at Pete? I've heard that. Okay. Uh, your first reaction to when Pete slid head first when you first saw it? I was doing it in Binger, Oklahoma. Because Pete was doing it? No, no, no. I hadn't seen Pete. This is back in the early 60s. So I had never TV. I wouldn't know who Pete was in 63. He came up as a rookie. So I never saw Pete Rose head first slide. I was head first sliding with Enos Slaughter. Is he the first one to do a head first slide? Enos Slaughter, yeah. He was known for that. And I did the head first slide. And then when I got up to Cincinnati, Pete was doing the head first slide. So I didn't do the head first slide anymore. (laughs) <laughs> it's his deal i mean i've never seen anybody i don't know if you can call it a slide i mean the but the statue he has in front of his stadium is yeah, perfect yeah, yeah that is absolutely pete rose that's the way he dove into everything with aggression aggressiveness i mean you can see you can still look back at the 1975 world series when he went into third if you can remember that base hit in there and he dove in there like that i mean He's two feet off the ground, flying through the air, and that's the way the statue, and that's the way it epitomized what Pete was. It's just, damn it, Pete, you did it to our, us, you did it to yourself, and it, and we're, and we're have to, and then we have to talk about this. We have to talk about what was was your life, and your life, no matter how you want to do it. Forty two hundred hits now goes no, he gambled. Rule 21 beats four. Rule 21 beats four to 4256. And that, that's the sad thing about it because God could he play. That's uh, Johnny Bench with Dan Patrick. As, as good a conversation as you're going to hear about Pete Rose and someone with unbelievable insight in Johnny Bench, who, as he said, was not only a longtime teammate, but also a business partner and someone who tried to get things right, but he just couldn't do it. And uh, he mentions Enos Slaughter there in the last part of it. In the Posnansky blog, if you read that, uh, he points out that Rose's father, who molded him to be a player somewhat in the same way that Mickey Mantle's father did with him, 
uh, his hero was Enos Slaughter. And as Posnanski said, Enos Slaughter attacked baseball the way Patton attacked war. So that's what you saw in Pete Rose, molded by the dad to be that guy and, uh, and became that player. One other thing, one last thing on Pete Rose. Rick Riley wrote many years for Sports Illustrated, uh, worked for ESPN after that, and has been semi-retired for, for quite a while. But he writes from time to time for the Post, and it's not in the sports section. It's in the op-ed section. And he wrote about his own experiences covering Pete Rose. This goes back to 1985 when he was with SI. And he said, one night I went to stay at his house after he'd won a home game as the Cincinnati Reds player manager. It was the same year he got his 4,192nd hit, breaking Ty Cobb's record and making him the all-time major league hit later. It had been an exhausting night with 100 managerial moves. After he dealt with reporters and grabbed a two-minute shower, we were rolling home in his car, Pete fiddling with the radio so he could yell at the sports talk host, idiots, he said, turning it up. I might add, though, uh, by the way, uh, sports radio had not been invented in 1985. I was part of the first wave of that in 1987. But probably somebody was doing a post-game show uh, about the Reds. Anyway, uh, he said, when we got home about midnight, his wife, Carol, a former Philadelphia Eagles cheerleader, was still up and asked if we wanted pancakes. I wanted pancakes, but Pete didn't even notice her. He was already working the TV, trying to figure out who'd won the night's hockey games and then moaned, moaned, G.D. Canucks. Think about that. He's a player manager with the Reds, and his focus after the game is the hockey that he bet on. I I have no doubt that Pete knew baseball. Uh, He probably knew enough about football. I don't think he knew enough to bet on hockey, and who does know enough to bet on hockey? But in 1985, that was his focus after the game, that he had bet on the Vancouver Canucks. What does that tell you about his gambling addiction? And uh, and that was the fatal flaw for his for his life, really. I mean, if you if 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 that doesn't happen, if the gambling doesn't happen, he celebrated in the same way that Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle and Hank Aaron and all the other greats are celebrated. And nobody reveled in that more than Pete. But the gambling, the gambling is what stains him. And as uh, Bart Giamatti said, when he banned him for life. And, uh, and banned him, I guess, for all eternity, because this is going to be a debate now Now that he's gone. Uh, and now that, as as Bench said, baseball has embraced gambling, um, do you rethink this and put him in? But the line from Bart Giamatti when he banned him was that Pete Rose had stained the game. And the stain on Pete Rose is always going to be the gambling. Uh, as, as Bench eloquently said, Rule 21 trumps 40, 42 56, and that was his hit total, the hit king. But uh, that is what uh, that will be, uh, the, the, that is, uh, among the first lines in his obituary. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk to Ben McDonald as uh, the Orioles try to stay alive today against the Kansas City Royals. Ben did uh, the telecast yesterday on ESPN. He's been doing mass and games for years. We'll also hear from Brandon Hyde and Gunnar Henderson and other Orioles as they, uh, they say what you always say at this time, win or go home and uh, where they stand, and it's not, it's not solid footing because history shows that they're in a tough spot losing game one of the series. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. Can the Orioles buck the odds? And can the Orioles bring the level down just a bit, Isaac? Can they buck the odds, and can they manage to do what no team has done since the start of this new format in the best of three wild card as uh they are now backs against the wall down 0-1 after losing one nothing yesterday to the royals and since they changed the format remember when the nationals won the world series in 2019 it was a one game one game playoff uh one game wild card which was played at nats park and they came from behind to hit the unhittable Josh Hader. It was that incredible, uh, well, it, it wound up being a double that Juan Soto tried to stretch into a triple and got thrown out. But most important thing is he cleared the bases, and that proved to be the difference as uh, they won the opening game or won that game 4-3. to three. Uh, Trent Grisham missed playing his ball in the outfield, and, uh, and Juan Soto forever sits in the hearts of Washington baseball fans for delivering in that situation as uh, as they won the game and moved on. And so now uh, here's here's the numbers as uh, Chelsea Jane's 
points out in her uh, in her story today, she covered the Orioles game yesterday. In this era of the expanded postseason, when October begins with a four best of three series, the tiniest of taps often topple months worth of dominoes. Since MLB introduced the best of three first round in 2022, game one has always been decisive. All eight series, the team that won the opening game advanced only once did a series reach three games. So it is no exaggeration to say that the Royals one nothing win over the Orioles on Tuesday at Camden Yards will forever bend the trajectories of both organizations now think about that that seems to be a bit of an overstatement doesn't it one game really it's going to change the trajectory of the two organizations well here's the rest of her explanation the Orioles are on the brink of another swift postseason elimination having suffered their ninth straight playoff loss I would asterisk that though it, it's really five. I mean, the, the previous ones took place before anybody else was on the team. But anyway, it's the longest active streak in the majors over a decade of October disappointment. They squandered the exact start they hoped that they would get from Corbin Burns when they traded for him in the offseason, knowing it might be the only free agent to be that gives them that. The Royals, meantime, are on the verge of advancing in the division series after a remarkable one-year turnaround. They have every reason to believe that the player they committed more money to than anyone in their history can not only bring playoff baseball back to Kansas City, but make it memorable, too. That's Bobby Witt, who drove in the game-winning run. So it seems like an overstatement on that, but uh, if you look at the way these have played out, uh, all, all game one, all game one winners have advanced to the next round and only once, only once has the series gone to three games. And yesterday prior to the Braves losing in San Diego, and that was inevitable, you know, they, they had to play a late afternoon game at home and then hop on the plane and fly across the country to play a game in San Diego where the Padres were well rested and they won for nothing. I, I would not be surprised to see the Braves come back today but uh, that is that is postseason baseball and it's not the postseason baseball that I grew up with it, it really isn't it is a total crapshoot now and you know could the Orioles be the ones that bucket and uh, and and make it to the next round and, and maybe even win the World Series this year yeah they, they you know it's a total total crapshoot there's no 100 win teams and uh, and even when like the Nationals won in 2019 they knocked off Two teams that had won 100-plus. Uh, yeah, yeah. the Dodgers had won 106 games. They beat them in a best-of-five series, 3-2. And in the World Series, they beat the Astros, who won 105 games and became the only team in baseball history to win all four games on the road. But right now, it's, it's not looking promising for the Orioles, who continue to do the same thing, leave runners on base. And they left five on base yesterday. And, uh, and that was a real issue. So I'll talk more about that with, uh, with Ben McDonald coming up at 1030. Uh, Isaac is here today. And uh, as I often talk about uh, age and, uh, and, and, and first memories, uh, I was, let's see, how old was five years ago? So I was over 60 when uh, the Nationals won the World Series. Uh, my dad was approaching 90 uh, when that happened. I guess he was 90. Yeah, he was 90 years old. And he had never seen one in his lifetime. So you were, what, 21, 20 at that time? 21. 21. Okay. So when the team, and you're rooting, you're rooting for the Nationals, right? You're a Nationals fan? Yes, I was. Okay. Did, oh. did, did you feel any sense of, gee, this is awfully early in my life to get a treat like this? Yes? No? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. It was right before the first day of practice. Uh, I was in the middle of Pennsylvania in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, Pirates country, and I was watching the World Series with all the D.C. area uh students and yeah. it was exciting yeah i mean because you know you look at red sox fans who waited 86 years uh cubs 108 years and you know for my dad who who was born after they had won their last world series he was a little kid when they won the pennant in 33 so he, he didn't have any real sense of that and he rooted for really bad Senators teams before they left uh, for Minnesota in 60, replaced by the expansion Senators. Those are the games that I went to with him. They were equally bad except for 69 where they had a really good year. Then they went to Texas, and it was 33 years without baseball. So we had both been through a long walk in the desert before that happened. And, uh, and so when they finally won the World Series, you get a sense of, wow, 
this is great, but you also have to have the perspective of cities like Boston and Chicago, which went all those years without it. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so yeah. So uh, I, I look at you and I go, hey, you got a championship when you were in your 20s. That's pretty damn good. And and, I, you know, I have a lot of faith in Mike Rizzo and uh, it's it's hard to win them. You can have great teams. The Braves put together one of the great teams in history in the 1990s. They won one. They win a lot. But they got beat by the Yankees a number of times. Um, they they just couldn't couldn't get over the hump in the World Series, and so it's it's difficult to win, and it's probably more difficult than ever now that you've got to win multiple rounds. Um, as a wild card team, you've got to win four rounds to win the World Series, and that's that's tough to do. And I think it's a much bigger crapshoot than even the NFL because the NFL. Generally, uh, the better teams get to the Super Bowl. Generally, that's the case. And an experienced team like we just saw with Kansas City uh, did it. Anyway, memories. This is a, this was a lot of fun to listen to uh, yesterday. Memories of that World Series with uh, Ryan Zimmerman, who was on a podcast that is hosted by Tim Kirkchin and his son. And uh, they, they have guests on who are you know familiar with Tim. They know him, which is, which is a lot of fun. But... Uh, they love baseball, and they love talking about stories with these guys. And so uh, when Zimmerman was on the other day, uh, one of the things they talked about, and I was at this game, this was one of the great uh, sports memories that I have. When they opened up Nats Park in 2009, I was there with my dad, my son, my nephew, and my brother-in-law. And in my basement, I have a great picture of all of us with the backdrop of the American flag on the field for the game. Uh, and it was a great night. The park was filled. It was the first time we're in the brand new park. I was actually there when they were building it, but now it was finished and it was, it was bright and shiny. And they had this national spotlight with Sunday night baseball and it had the perfect ending with Ryan Zimmerman, two outs with a walk off home run. And this was Zimmerman yesterday or the other day on the, uh, on the Kirkchen podcast recalling that night. It's almost crazy how it all worked out. I mean, Grew up in Virginia Beach, went to UVA, got drafted by the Nationals, came into an organization that was basically rebuilding. Um, you know, I, who knows if I would have been in the big leagues as soon as I was, if I was with a different organization. It's just funny how all these things seem to happen. And, you know, you see a lot of stories like that in sports. And and that's, to me, what's so awesome about all sports is the, the, the stories and and you know, the, the people that are involved in it. And, you know, that night, it's funny. I remember, I obviously remember that at bat. I remember lots of at bats. And I could tell you every pitch when I'm sitting there looking at the computer screen, what it's going to be, you know, 00, 10, 11. But that night we were playing the Braves and Peter Moreland was pitching, who is one of the best humans on the face of the planet, by the way. Hilariously funny, right. Un- unbelievable. And McCann was catching, who I became really good friends with because we sort of came up around the same time and played against each other for years. And Peter Mullen, if you go back and look at the bat, the first pitch was like a fastball, I'll say right down the middle. It might have been a little low in the strike zone, not low out of the strike zone. And and I forget who the umpire was, but he balled it. And I kind of took it and I heard ball and I was like, oh, man. And I looked back at McCann and, like, he kind of was (laughs) – he was like – I, I don't know where that's at. So like, but it's funny because, because that pitch like completely turned the bat for me. So instead of being down Oh one against Peter Moreland, who throws a heavy sinker and then has a slider that you have to worry about as a right-handed hitter, but he's more the sinker guy. So now I'm one Oh, instead of Oh one. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just selling out for that. I, that sinker that I just saw, I, I basically got a free look at it so I could see what it was going to do. And then obviously the next pitch is when I when I hit the home run. But those are the kind of things that you dream about and want to be a part of. And you know, I I always say I, you know, the walk off home runs and the game winning hits and all that. Like, you know, everyone says, "Oh, how'd you have so much success in those situations?" And I said, "Well, if you look at the numbers, I don't know if I had that that much success. <laughs> I just I I got out plenty of times too. But I think the biggest thing is." I think you have to want to be in those situations. And I got a chance to do the one of the UVA commencement speeches this year. And 
I was scared to death and it took me two, <laughs> two months to write it. But yeah, I'm like, what am I going to tell these kids that now have a college degree of which I don't have and I'm not going to be giving these guys advice. Um, but, but one of the things was sort of that, that part of my career is I was known as getting walk off hits. And, and I said, I didn't really have a great plan or anything. I said, the only thing is I wanted to be in that situation. I would rather be in that situation with a chance to win the game and fail than not have a chance to win or lose the game. Yeah, and uh, he had other walk-offs, too. There was a really a memorable one at RFK Stadium on Father's Day where he walked off the Yankees. And it, it was happening not frequently, but enough that I remember we were doing the show on the other station, and I was talking to Zabe about coming up with a nickname for him. Like when I was in San Antonio and you had the San Antonio Spurs with George Gervin and Larry Keenan, they were really a great team coming over from the ABA. And the point guard was James Silas. And the Silas nickname was Captain Late because he was always seemingly hitting a game-winning shot or or making a big steal or, or something big down the stretch of a game. So that was a great nickname. And I, I've tried to make Captain Late stick to Ryan Zimmerman, but it never did. But that was a wonderful night uh, as they opened up the season in 2009. Unfortunately, the rest of the season was bad. Like the first couple of years there, they were a 100-loss team because they were rebuilding. If you remember this, when they came from Montreal in 2005, Major League Baseball had owned them, and they were trying to draw as many people as they could to Montreal. So they traded away a lot of good prospects for veteran players who made them immediately – pretty good and in the first year that they were here they're actually in first place by like four or five games on the fourth of july before they you know went back to their level in the second half and finished 500 and then they they totally rebuilt the roster so by the time you get to 2009 uh, aside from some young and up-and-coming players like zimmerman it's it's not a very good team uh one more from zimmerman and this is about winning the world series and it's about the run that they made in 2019 where you get the big hit off the unhittable josh Hader to win that game against Milwaukee 4-3. They beat the Dodgers 3-2 in a best-of-five series and then uh, swept St. Louis in the National League Championship Series 4-0, which, you know, in many ways exercised some ghosts because if if you went back a, a few years for the first time they made the playoffs in 2012, they had a chance to close them out in a best-of-five series. I think they were up 6-2 to two at one point, and they wound up losing that game. So that was, that was huge to to sweep St. Louis and to be well-rested for the World Series, which didn't go the way they wanted it to because they lost uh, all of their games at home but uh, won the four on the road, including the last one, uh, which they won 6-2, to two, uh, helped by the Howie Kendrick two-run homer in the seventh inning where they scored three runs. And in that, in that run to the World Series, they won five elimination games, and they were down in all five of them. That was an unbelievable feeling of comeback after comeback after comeback. They beat the 106-win Dodgers and the 105-win Astros to win the World Series. And this is Zim's remembrance of that October and how special it was. Oh, man, it's, there's nothing like October baseball. And, um, you know, we, like you said, we, have a, we had a lot of experience in October. A lot of it was never past the first, first <laughs> round, unfortunately. Uh, but I think all those failed experiences led us ultimately to 2019. And, and very rarely do you see a team or a core group of guys on a team get to the playoffs and make a run to the World Series or win the World Series that first time. And, and October baseball is just so much different than regular season baseball. I mean, everything's magnified. You know, you have to take advantages of the mistakes. You know, if a starting pitcher – gives up three or four runs in two innings, they're out of the game. So it's just such a different animal in the postseason. Um, but I think the coolest thing about the 2019 run was, you know, being in the first round, however many times it was before we got past the first round, you kind of see the media and, you know, the, the, the concentration or the focus on your series in that first round. And then we finally got past the first round and the second round, it gets a little bit more. And then you keep going and then, and then you get to the world series. And I just thought the world series was the greatest stage. You walk out for that first time when you're taking BP 
and you're like four people deep from third base to first base around the field of media and, and people there to watch BP. And I just remember walking out there and be like, holy cow, this is like the coolest thing I've ever done. You know, this is why you work. This is what you, this is you, what you want to get to. And I'll never forget that night in Houston, looking at the big out of town scoreboard in left field there and seeing only the one game. <laughs> so and, good. And like, wow. I get like goosebumps, like, talking about it now but like like you're the only game in the world of baseball that matters like on this night it was just a really really cool feeling that night and what was the feeling like when you won the world series did you cry who did you call what was that like right yeah i mean i love that that inning uh you know i think we were we were up three four four runs something like that and you know, we got one out and then, you know, I've been, I've played for a long time. So I got, and I enjoy talking to people on the field. I, you know, I, I'm relaxed on the field. Everyone's like, how you talk to this person, that person. And I've made pretty good relationships with all the umpires. And I'll never forget. We got the first out and I turned to the umpire and he's like, Hey, Zim, congrats, man. Like, you know, couldn't happen to a better person. I'm so happy for you. And I'm like, dude, there's one out. Like, what, what? what are you doing? You know, like, you know, the, the the superstitious baseball person, like, really kicked in. And, like, and he's like, dude, you, you're fine. Like, I just wanted to do it before it happened because it's going to be crazy. And, like, you know, I, so I remember that. And then, obviously, Huddy, Huddy strikes out Brantley and, and I just, I, you know, from there it gets a little cloudy. You just kind of like, you know, you work so hard to get to that point. And then I remember running over and me and Rendon jumping and hugging each other, like basically like what my son's T-ball kids did. <laughs> the other day. <laughs> so I guess we, we revert all the way back to the beginning. The ride with that team was so crazy. And, you know, everyone was like, oh, did you go party that night? Did you go? And once you finally like calmed down and went inside, you were just mentally exhausted from that run because every single pitch, especially in the playoffs and of course in the world series, I mean, you were locked in on every single pitch to the point where by like midnight or one o'clock that night, I was probably the most tired I've ever been after a baseball game. That's a Ryan Zimmerman on the Tim Kirchin and son podcast, which is called, is this a great game or what? And I'd never heard that story, but that's, that's so cool. And you don't get that sense that anything like that can happen when you're sitting in the stands, but here's Ryan Zimmerman closing in on his world series championship after all the all the rough years that he went through with the Nats, first the uh, 100 lost seasons, then the disappointment in the playoffs, and then, you know, finally he's coming to the end of his career, he's going to get a World Series ring. And the umpire, with still two outs to go, starts to congratulate him, and he's thinking, hey, you know, you know, crazy things that happen, don't jinx it here. Uh, that's a great story. I had not heard that before. And uh, if you've if not uh, watched or listened to the whole podcast, uh, you can get it up on, uh, I guess, YouTube or any of the places that uh, you find podcasts. It's called "Is This Game Is This a Great Game or What?" Uh, now I mentioned that the Nats had five elimination games coming from behind in all five of them. The Brewers are at the other end of the spectrum now. Uh, they had a a lead yesterday against the Mets, and uh, here come the here, here come the, the here come the Mets as they uh, as they win the game eight to four. And Milwaukee is the first team now in Major League history to blow a multi-run lead in four straight postseason games. They had a 3-0 lead in Game 1 of the 2023 National League Wild Card Series against the Diamondbacks, but lost 6-3 in Game 2. They jumped out to a 2-0 lead and lost 5-2. And then three years ago in Game 4 of the NLDS, the Brewers led the Braves 2-0 before suffering a 5-4 season-ending loss. So uh, that's got to be very frustrating for the people in Milwaukee, as it's, I'm sure, frustrating for the people in Baltimore that they have now lost nine straight postseason games. We'll get into more of that with Ben McDonald coming up. Uh, also this, and uh, I've been watching what's been going on in Colorado. They had a big win last week, but I, I still believe that Deion Sanders is going to leave at the end of the season. I don't think he's going to be fired but I just think that, uh, you know, with 
his two sons leaving and just all the drama that builds up around there. He's he's going to go. I don't know whether he'll go. I don't think he's going to get a head coaching job in the NFL. Um, maybe Jerry Jones, you know, in a, in a desperate move does that. But uh, there's just, just too much swirl around this, including this story that uh, surfaced yesterday that a bankruptcy judge is denying Shiloh Sanders, not Shador. Shador is the quarterback. Shiloh is a cornerback with the team. He's it's hurt now but could come back in the next game. Um, but uh, there is a an $11 million suit that has been filed against him, and Shiloh Sanders has declared bankruptcy in an attempt to dismiss the complaint, and the judge said, no, no, no. He said this, this can proceed. He's not off the hook for the $11 million in, in, that uh, he is in debt for here or the $11 million judgment. Uh, he did file for bankruptcy a year ago, but um, that's not going to fly, according to this judge. And this goes back to 2015 when Shiloh was a ninth grader at this phony baloney school that uh, Dion had put together, which has since folded up. But there was a security guard there. And uh, his name is, uh, what is his name? John Dargine. And uh, Shiloh, as a ninth grader, uh, allegedly uh, hit Dargine in the chest and gave him permanent injuries from a roundhouse elbow when Dargine was trying to confiscate his phone at the school. Dargine then sued Sanders for damages, but the case didn't go to trial until 2022. So this incident happened in 2015. It's not till seven years later that it goes to trial. And he didn't show up. Sanders didn't show up to defend himself. So the $11 million judgment stood, and it's been rolling along for the last two years. He's trying to avoid it by declaring bankruptcy, but the judge says that's not going to fly. He's a grad student there, and uh, he, I guess he's, he's going to go to the NFL with his brother, but he's also got he not maybe not the level of deals that his brother has with the NIL. But I I've been saying this for uh, over a year now that the most symbolic moment to me of the NIL is Shador Sanders' Rolls Royce being booted on the campus because he had too many parking tickets. Yeah, that that to me is the symbol of the excess now of the NIL and why somebody's got to get their arms around this and set this up the way it should be set up where these guys get contracts, they get paid. If they want to leave, they got buyouts in the contracts. It is professional sports. Treat it like professional sports. But stop this nonsense of uh, the collective and, you know, name, image, and likeness, which really it isn't. They get paid to play and uh, and just, just make it legit. That's the way... Uh, they should do it. One other thing, um, and, and this is this is driving related. Remember Eddie Lacy? Eddie Lacy was a big running back from Alabama, great player uh, in college, went to the Green Bay Packers and really had trouble controlling his weight. He played there for about four years and uh, last played in the NFL with Seattle in 2017. So it's been a while. He was arrested in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I guess he lives, uh, for not just DUI, but extreme DUI. His blood alcohol was reported to be 0.20. The legal limit, I think, is 0.8. So we're, we're tickling three times the legal limit. And I don't know what Eddie Lacy is weighing these days, but he was about 240 when he played. So you can imagine, even if he's at his playing weight, the amount of alcohol you'd have to consume to get to 0.20. He was taken into custody on a charge of possessing and possessing an open container of alcohol as well. But extreme DUI. Come on. My God. If, if you're going to drink, it's so easy now. Call an Uber. Don't get behind the wheel of a car. And to think what, thank God, nobody got hurt in this. But to, 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 to get to a point two zero on that, that is, man. That is some scary stuff. All right, we're going to talk to Ben McDonald coming up as we do Orioles preview. Orioles trying to stay alive today against the Kansas City Royals. We'll have the game for you right here on ESPN 630, pregame at 4, first pitch at 430. Orioles preview next. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630.